Hey everybody, it's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Venture Stories by Village Global. I'm back today with a uh, recent fan favorite, uh, Samo Budia. Uh, Samo, welcome to the podcast. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again. Uh, so, so we were just talking about before this, uh, you know, some people critique, uh, democracy saying, Hey, it's, it's not clear that it's the, the best, you know, form, form of government. And there's sort of a, you know, increasing sort of awareness that that may be true with what's going on with, you know, in the U.S., with, you have, you know, with Brexit. And so an alternative some people have proposed is sort of is a CEO driven. Uh, country, you know, sort of the rise of charter cities. Imagine sort of, you know, the rise, how successful Singapore has been. Why don't you talk about how you see alternatives to democracy, uh, in generally that could potentially be workable? And maybe let's first start with, you know, uh, the feasibility of a CEO driven country. Yes. I, I think that always you have to consider that a form of government has to be relatively well suited to the culture and economy of a given country. I think that, for example, if you try to reform the current U.S. system, which I do have to emphasize, I think, you know, has democratic elements, but it's not really a democracy. So it doesn't fulfill up to, to its own uh, ideals, right? If yeah. we assume those ideals to be democratic or if we assume those ideals to be freedom driven, it doesn't live up to either. Right. But is, is that ideal? Some people say, you know, make, make it seem as it's a democracy, but it's actually not. Well, you know, I, that's a very interesting question. I think that. Generally speaking, uh, governments should be as honest as possible about their own functioning. Y- you know, I'm not a fan of euphemisms, right? So I think that, you know, if you have to make an argument that we have to militarily say intervene in a country, I don't like euphemisms. I prefer, say, the term war to the term intervention, right? right? The term war carries with itself an, an honesty about, like, what kind of uh, material and human costs they have. Now, of course, if you have like a very advanced military, perhaps the term war evokes mass casualties, but you don't actually expect mass casualties because your aircraft are so good and your drones are so good. But there is a civilian side cost on the other side, right? So even if you expect to win in a one-sided way is to have few costs on your own population, I think it is more honest to talk about it as war. And when it comes to policing actions, right, I think that we have a very strong um, hypocrisy in our society where we neglect its existing authoritarian elements. We all saw the very, you know, very cyberpunk like pictures of Hong Kong protesters uh, shining laser pointers at policemen. Now, let me ask you something. What would be the change in regulations where a British protester in London to shine laser lasers into a policeman's eye? Like th- 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 there would be a crackdown, right? Like it would be considered an outrage. Yeah. So why do we consider this as like, you know, a sign of fighting a strong, oppressive government in Hong Kong, but the same exact action, say, in London, if it provoked a crackdown, we wouldn't think twice about it? Well, part of the answer is that, you know, these are very different countries and we have a tribal impulse where we sort of want to see things from our perspective and assume that our system is justified. But then if we wish to understand the world, we have to understand that, you know, mainland Chinese will feel often very much similarly. And there's also like, you know, just to say a small thing about Hong Kong, there existed a uh, class and cultural divide between Hong Kong and the mainland, where Hong Kong for a very long time, well, frankly, they felt superior to the mainlanders. And economic growth recently has caused living standards to catch up. But the mainlanders haven't forgotten. And they sort of have this, you know, popular stereotype. When you talk to them, they have the popular stereotype of people in Hong Kong being ignorant of what's happening in the rest of China, of being spoiled, of being privileged. And if you imagine, for example, that there were massive protests right here in San Francisco, where we are, and some of the protesters were arguing that, you know, San Francisco should be independent from the United States, and occasionally they would, like, wave Chinese flags, and there was some evidence that the Chinese ambassador is meeting with the protesters, and the protesters were shining lasers into the eyes of the police officers. Well, what would the typical American think about a presidentially ordered crackdown? I think whether it would be an Obama-ordered one or a Trump-ordered one, it would come with some controversy, but the government wouldn't lose legitimacy. In many people's eyes, it would seem legitimate. Now, I'm not saying this because, you know, I, I love the Chinese government. I think what's happening to the Uyghur is, in fact, probably unconscionable. 
But I do think that if we don't understand this world around us and don't embrace a wider perspective, the 21st century will continue to be perplexing. A lot of our 20th century assumptions won't hold. We're going to have to develop, strangely, a form of political empathy. We're going to have to develop an ability to put ourselves into the minds of people living in very different political systems. Now, perhaps to circle back to you, to your original question of like, you know, is democracy an ideal? I think good government is an ideal. I think a government that, you know, respects rights of citizens, but also makes sure that public infrastructure is well developed, make sure the economy works well. All of these things are, in fact, often in conflict. And where on this matrix of trade-offs you set the pin, I think that's a pragmatic question. I think for China, one of its great historic achievements is that hundreds of millions of people were lifted out of poverty. And of course, it's one of the great historic achievements of the world market because this happened in a context of trade and integration, partial integration in the Western economic order. On the other hand, we, however, like have to think about the failures, right? Like when people are looking in places like East Africa or the rest of Asia for a developmental model, Western democracies seem to just be worse options than what China has offered. And I think raising yourself out of poverty is extremely important. I think it's very easy for us to talk about the finer points of our national conversation, decide which kind of memes are acceptable and which kind of memes are not acceptable, decide whether, you know, it's it's fine for newspapers to behave in this way or it's fine for Twitter to behave in that way. These are rounding errors when it comes to the very real threats of, say, things like malnourishment or outbreaks of infectious diseases or just the the sort of small grind of poverty that demoralizes you over and over again. Now, still, you know, you you can have a beautiful, beautiful life, even in a poor country, but it's obviously better to be rich than to be poor. And I think everything else is just a rationalization. Yeah. It is interesting. You sort of think, you know, in companies, people talk about, you know, the Apple approach sort of, you know, laser focus on, on the product versus like a Amazon approach, you know, the customer driven company. And it's interesting to think about it in the context of, of government's as well, but there's all this, there's this critique that some people have that capitalism is incompatible with democracy o- over the long term. Um, how do you think about that? And how do you like, let's talk about East Africa. You, you think a lot about that. Well, well, yeah. Um, on the critique, I'm very willing to address it just head on. Um, capitalism means many different things to many different people, as does democracy. But I think that if by capitalism we mean sustained technological and material progress, If that is incompatible with democracy, well, so much worse for democracy, right? And if by this we mean something more subtle, like the way we have been organizing our economy so far is undermining these public goods, things like a high trust culture or people believing the news that they read because the news they read is like at least not lying to them, even if it's selective. And without those, technological innovation won't be able to occur anyway. I think in that case, we have to take those critiques of capitalism seriously. So insofar as we want to have real embodied instantiated progress in our society rather than just the narrative of progress, we have to focus on these functional institutions and how they bring about technological innovation. In many ways, IBM at the peak of its creativity was not a capitalist's ideal. It was basically, you know, free from competition, right? It certainly wasn't the market mechanisms that were producing innovation within IBM. At best, the market mechanisms were helping IBM deal with the complexity of the rest of society. I mean, in the 1980s, the term yuppie was introduced to discuss the new phenomena of young, talented people demanding uh, market wages for their work. Before that, it was assumed, well, you come into a big, giant company, you pay your dues by working very hard for 10 or 20 years, and then eventually you get a privileged position. And what was changing in the 80s was that, oh, the labor market became much more real than it had been before. You could, in fact, go to a company and demand market wages right away, as long as you could perform uh, appropriately. So if we could then zoom back, IBM in previous decades... Even hiring and firing perhaps didn't quite work the way a labor market in theory should work. So I find it interesting that economists who have been the most insightful, in my opinion, are the ones that have focused on what's happening inside companies. Because I think economists have to start investigating more and more non-market mechanisms, not as the exception to the economy, 
but is perhaps the heart of the economy, with the market mechanism just being a necessary, important, efficient part of a much larger tool set of social technologies. This sometimes gets brought up with public policy and so on. So people may talk about governance interventions. They might talk about the economics of decision making, policy making, and so on. But, you know, except for Coates' theory of the firm, I don't see much work on how internal organization of companies might work. Arguably, the one of the genius uh, points of Silicon Valley has been to focus what happens within your startup and focusing on things like company culture. No, no, let's assume company culture is real. And let's assume that it is as tangible a feature of the company, you know, the social technologies you use internally as any product might be. And I think they've reinvented uh, something completely different. Now, of course, Silicon Valley has its own group think, but I think through this ferment of ideas, it's developed a second culture. You've ever heard um, there was this term for the two cultures that distinguishes between uh, STEM and uh, humanities-oriented approaches and how they use different languages and different ways of doing things? I think the American economy now has two cultures as well. There's corporate America that is a clear descendant of IBM, modified through 1980s, you know, sort of Gordon Gecko style, greed is good logic, this very ruthless careerist thing. And on the other hand, there's this um, somewhat, somewhat stifling in its own way, Silicon Valley consensus with the startup culture. Like, you know, when you wear the company hoodie, that's as much a uniform as the gray suit of the 1950s. And However, these two cultures are still learning to talk. And for the most part, when these two cultures fight, Silicon Valley wins. And that's a reason perhaps to like continue betting whenever you can that this set of norms, this West, Co West Coast set of norms will be perceived both as more economically efficient and higher status. And hopefully it'll actually be more functional. But I, I do think that the old system had some realities to it as well. Um, the old sort of corporate American culture that still exists there in the wild knows how to take, say, you know, an MBA and, and use them moderately productively. Meanwhile, Silicon Valley companies don't know what to do with them. And we've also seen in the last decade, you know, Silicon Valley go from, you know, up, upstart, uh, you know, doing great things with in the Obama presidency to, you know, villains because because of Trump and because of lots of other because of all the power they they've amassed. How do you see that evolving over the next? decade to decades? I think uh, what will happen is Silicon Valley will become integrated into the media ecosystem of the East Coast. Uh, what will happen is Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, their successors will hire more and more East Coast graduates. As the old media jobs fall away, new media jobs will be created on the West Coast. There'll be a merger between the old media establishment and the new social media establishment with some personnel turnover with the balance of power moving slightly towards Silicon Valley. But ultimately, I think what should be remembered is that, you know, Facebook were to use its ability to control the national conversation, to bias the con national conversation in their own favor, would not be hated. So in an interesting way that Silicon Valley has become the villain suggests that they have not used their media power to shape the narrative in their own favor. I think this shows that they are not that interested in political power, ultimately. Uh, there was perhaps talk that, you know, Zuckerberg might want to run for president. I think that was just never the case. I think what was happening there is he was legitimately trying to learn about the country. And this can be very difficult for people on the East Coast to imagine because they can't imagine visiting, um, you know, visiting flyover states as anything but a cynical gambit. If you ever imagine like a relatively well-intentioned nerd that in fact has not had much life experience outside the Silicon Valley bubble, you realize he probably had some real learning experiences from that. I definitely know people who didn't bring cameras with them that basically did road trips across America, road trips, right? Not flying on a jet, uh, literally to learn about what is this country that I've been living on, living in this whole time. Right. California is very isolated. In the normal course of your social graph, you're only going to meet the people who have left the rest of the country. Right. So because I think they're not that interested in power, I think they will fold to the East Coast. I think the East Coast establishment, media establishment will continue to flounder and not really succeed, but it will be spinning off a new center. So eventually when you're going to go into a San Francisco social media company, it's going to feel inside its inside much more like the New York Times. Yeah. And some people are not going to like that result. I think people 
believe that Twitter, Facebook, Google, uh, YouTube, they should be neutral platforms that just express the natural uh, interest and virality of things. But, you know, virality and truth are different things, as the left has learned. And as the right has learned, I think there is no really, there's no neutral stand, there's no neutral ground to stand on. The universe is incredibly complex. The social world is incredibly complex. For whatever narrative you wish to support, you will find many, many true things. Now, I, of course, believe that, you know, truth-based propaganda is better than propaganda that admits falsehoods, but it's still propaganda. If I'm directing your attention to a controversy, I've already achieved most of the bits of control, if you yeah. if we translate this into an information theory perspective. Uh, what you decide to, you know, between my two options, like Coke or Pepsi, once you're spending your time making that choice, well, we're already, we're already agreed that your body should ingest sugar. Right. We've already agreed on that. We've already agreed that you should have caffeine. And we've already agreed that, you know, fizzy water feels, you know, nice in your mouth and so on. Um, these sort of limits of the public conversation are ones that then require curation. And in the world of yesterday, you know, in the world of yesterday, there were a few big media companies and the directors of the large, uh, the large networks in, TV, right? The US had a small number of networks. I think it was five networks. 1950, all of those directors had previously worked together during World War II in the Office of War Information. So these are old buddies, like they knew each other. And they weren't really trying to compete with each other. It wasn't like these TV networks were trying to drive each other out of business. They had a very livable uh, arrangement. In this context, it's, it's very clear that if you look at how the New York Times was structured internally, not in the 1950s, but the 1990s, at the start of the year, they would gather the interns, they would gather the writers, and they would talk about, well, what is the narrative arc for this year? People can find articles on this topic. This is just, you know, from straightforwardly from memoirs of people who've worked there. It's even in articles. And if you think about it, if you're running a newspaper, do you really tell your journalists, yeah, write about whatever? Yeah, you can travel wherever you want. That, that doesn't sound like a good way to run a business. Right. No, obviously you make a calculated bet as to what will be, what will matter this year. Yeah. And as if you are a big stakeholder in the national conversation, like the New York Times is, you're also going to understand realistically your own role in shaping that. So of course you're going to talk about a narrative and setting the national conversation. And then you'll tell your journalists which beats to patrol. Right. If you imagine them like police officers, so they will go out there into the world. They'll try to find real things. They'll do a good job. Ideally, they'll also fact check. Uh, but again, you decided at the start of the year what is going to be news in May. Right. So and that's like quite powerful. Change? How's this going to change in the next decade in terms of how the national conversation is? I think we're going to go back to that model. I think a lot of people are seeking algorithmic corrections, but I think algorithms, you know, they reliably do things that we as people uh, don't really approve of. It requires a lot of judgment. And the biggest problem is that, you know, when they set an algorithm to uh, sort this information, when a strange decision is, you know, found, uh, such as uh, when people are recommended more and more uh, extreme videos over time. The leadership of the company, the leadership of the social media company is held responsible and they are personally held responsible. It's controversial. People might get fired. So if these impartial algorithms that have these strange edge cases are already going to be a personal liability for you, don't you want there to be some sort of human curation? And how can you find a human curator that won't be objectionable? Well, you'll hire a journalist. So Facebook and Twitter will hire journalists. I think that's what will happen. What about YouTube? I think YouTube is going to be in a much more difficult situation where it's going to be facing stiff competition from Chinese-driven social media sites. I think Chinese social media sites will be less sensitive to the social stigmatization that, say, YouTube is sensitive to. So, for example, like, you know, TikTok is very interesting, right? People under 22 just use TikTok, and YouTube feels old to them. For people between, like, 22 and 26, YouTube is where it's at, basically. Even very intelligent people, uh, they might reference books and articles. Yeah. But if you talk to them, you realize, oh, wait, you actually listen to the podcast or you watch the YouTube video, of the uh, of the book author, and only then did you pick up the book, and you haven't even finished the book. Yet here you've been talking to me about the arguments from the book. I think this is an age-old tradition. Um, 
when I was talking when I was talking to Tyler uh, Tyler Cowan about this, he mentioned that Star Trek was a great influence on his worldview. Now he doesn't cite Star Trek much on his blog. He cites all the books that I believe he really read and so on. Uh, but I think this is often the case. I think we often present our most highbrow influences rather than our lowbrow influences because we want to pretend to be constantly, you know, these philosopher kings moving through the world sovereignly instead of, you know, sometimes you just really love a good show. Yeah. Do you know how Star Trek influenced him, by the way? I think a lot of his humanistic ideals for uh, this sort of advance through uh, prosperity together with this freedom of exploration, I think he writes about it in uh, several pieces. Uh, I certainly see the compatibility with his with his current ideals because Star Trek is both like socially progressive and technologically progressive and in a way isn't even that naive. Yeah. Consider that, you know, on board the Starship Enterprise, we don't live in a consensus-based society. Uh, it's basically a military it's a science military, so it's mostly not killing people. It's mostly exploring space, yeah. but it's organized as a military, right. right? So it both shows the ideals that we should strive for and also yeah. notes what are ultimately practical human arrangements, yeah. right? It's not trying to, like, imagine humans are something that they're not. Right. Going back to political empathy for a second or how countries relate to each other, sort of Trump on China and trade has been really, really interesting with I mean, most people being critical in public conversation, but some in private or, or some in public saying, actually, maybe there's some sense here. We, we haven't had a fair deal for, for a long time. And, and maybe he's secretly a free trade, uh, you know, proponent, but actually trying to get a, a fair deal. What was your sort of perspective on what's happening between China and uh, Trump particularly, but also as well as trade, but also broadly, you know, there's this, um, there's a sort of religious belief by economists in free trade, but then there's sort of the Peter Thiel critique of, hey, maybe free trade isn't uh, as great as we think it is, particularly that he says globalization is on sort of one axis, you know, uh, horizontal axis, I think. And he says, you know, innovation is on a vertical axis and we need more innovation, less globalization. How do you, how do you respond to all that? I, I would say that I think that Trump does deserve credit in putting into stark relief the reality that China was not playing fair by the global rule set. I can't speak whether he thinks highly of the rules of the international order. My, my intuition would be no, that he actually doesn't care much about them. But whether or not he cares about them is, is quite tangential to this notion that, you know, we haven't been living in that world for a long time. He, he is a good wake up call, right? And I think that's, in fact, a positive service that uh, he provided. Ultimately, I think that free trade has its limitations for developing countries. And because free trade has its limitations for developing countries, we have to question the altruism of free trade proponents. I think a lot of them are convinced by economics arguments that this is the best way to organize the world's economy. But the reality is that the countries that have done the best job of developing, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and now China, have followed a very different model. Uh, they you know, read the works of Friedrich List, not Adam Smith. They also read Adam Smith, but they base the idea on protection of key industries that they develop. A very interesting point here might be that the Japanese uh, straightforwardly subsidized industries that were trying to export to the global market. And they did something very clever. They subsidized only the goods that were shipped abroad. So instead of having a domestic consumer base that's held captive to consuming bad cars that are subsidized by the state, a great example of this might be the Soviet Union with its Lada cars, right? You know, you need them to buy Soviet cars, you basically force them to buy Soviet cars, or you might have, you know, had nominal free trade, but the government gives uh, the native car manufacturers such a big leg up, such as happened in Iran in the 1980s, that no foreign car can compete. These manufacturers will not learn how to make a good car. If instead you have a reward them for exporting on the international market, then they will learn how to make a, a good car. Like you are subsidizing directly things meant for a foreign discerning market where people are not buying their first car, they're buying their 10th car. And in fact, they want their car to look good, right? And uh, Japanese designers had to adapt to the European market. Uh, for example, I think they had to uh, make use of the golden ratio in design, and then Europeans would buy uh, Japanese cars and so on. So to talk about basically globalization versus innovation, I think Peter Thiel's strongest point is one about the distinction between the first world and the third, having been transmuted into the distinction between the developing world 
and the developed world. When you say the first world, the idea is that the end of history hasn't arrived. You expect that this is part of the planet that's progressing rapidly, that's developing new technologies, that's getting richer. And then the third world is kind of lagging behind. You know, I think uh, the term developing world is, in fact, a better description of many parts of what used to be called a third world. Not all of them, mind you, but many of them. However, the term developed world implies that we're already there. We've already done everything. And I think this transformation happened from the 1960s to about today, where we set our expectations lower and lower. And the assumption is that our measure of progress is how much the rest of the world, the rest of the planet, will catch up to us and where we are. And that's the wrong measure of progress. Yeah. Let's talk about progress for a second, because recently Patrick Halston and uh, Todd Cowan came up with uh, this sort of proposal for progress as an academic study. I'm curious, and there's a lot of pushback from that. I'm, I'm curious how you, what you think of that uh, decision. But then also, there's this part of the internet that I, I'm discovering, I think it's called, they call themselves the sense-making web, which is basically trying to you say that progress is uh, unsustainable as we as we currently envision it because of environmental constraints, because of other constraints. And when you talk to someone like Tyler Cowen, he'll say, yeah, but what, on what time frame? 2,000 years? You know, I'll, I'll take that. And they, they say, hey, maybe it's not 2,000 years. Maybe it's 100 years. Or, or something. How do you sort of respond to, to all this sort of surrounding progress? I think the idea of progress studies is a relatively, is a relatively good one. I think both pa- Patrick and Tyler uh, note a real gap in the academic literature. Now, of course, the question is, how much good can the academic literature do? So we'll, have to, we'll all have to wait to see further moves to see if they can solve some of these key problems that exist in most academic research departments. It's endemic in any field of study for um, practitioners to claim as wide a possible of scope for what they purport to be doing but limit what they actually do to something very, very narrow. Whatever research you do, it better allow you to write a paper every seven months. And however you describe your field, well, it best sound as relevant to as many people as possible. And because of this, you will have uh, gaps where what is called progress studies and the way they define it and what I think is frankly like a quite good article This is something that in theory should be covered by sociologists, by economists, by political scientists, yet it seems to be an orphan. It's not really adopted by any of those people. Um, uh, No big academics have built their name on it. I guess maybe Steven Pinker has sort of built a name on this like very simple pro-enlightenment narrative, but I think he hasn't really done the scholarly work to understand the nature of progress, even if he's evangelizing some good results. Uh, so yeah, the, the criticism is coming from, I think, people who feel guilty about having claimed to be experts in something that they're not even studying. Right. <laughs> Their career incentives don't point towards it. And if you try to, you know, if you try to push in those directions, well, you know, good luck finding work after grad school. You're certainly not going to get tenure. Right. right? The competition there is extremely stiff. You have to be extremely conventional and you better stick to the center of your field. Uh, if you try to create a new interdisciplinary area, that's not the work of a single researcher. That's almost this coordinated organizational effort where you have to set up foundations and all of that stuff. So I imagine their efforts are going to go in that direction. Now, with regard to the sense-making critique of growth, progress, and so on, I think, you know, the earth has very real limits to growth. When exactly we hit them is an interesting question, but... I would be inclined towards thinking that we are midway through a transition, not necessarily an exponential curve that ends with the singularity, but an S-curve. In this moment, we are unsustainable. But will we be unsustainable after another 50 or 60 years? That's something that I think we can say for sure. There's no way to go back. There's only a way to go through. And if we're trying to go through, we should try as much as possible to re-engineer both our industrial supply chains, and here is where I differ from a conservationist, I think we should also engineer Earth's natural ecosystem to be more compatible with our industry. Perhaps we can't stop global warming, but perhaps, you know, the change in rainfall patterns allows us to expand uh, the green areas and have the Sahara become a lush green territory, even as some other parts of the world dry up. Perhaps Spain is going to be a desert country and Chad is going to be lush and green again. Yeah. Like that's an adaptation we we can live with ultimately. And the 
problems with externalities are ones that I think the sense making uh, intellectuals do a very good job of pointing out. There is a systemic problem with the process that has brought us progress so far. So it's not a simple matter of we'll just double down on technology. It is a matter of we will change the accounting of externalities while also advancing technology to reach a system that will be in a more symbiotic and stable equilibrium with the natural ecosystem. Have you seen any companies or, or movements that have any interesting approaches for how to internalize some of these externalities? And, and in the crypto community, that, that's what they were trying to do. But anyone trying to get around you know, internalized externalities is a tr tragedy of commons? I think that uh, I haven't, unfortunately, seen anything that's ex very promising. I, I do think there might be interesting possibilities in new forms of information aggregation. So I actually believe that machine learning will be extremely useful. Machine learning with humans in the loop seems like a system that perhaps can outperform most natural ecosystems. So maybe the best way to tackle the complexity of the current economy and the natural ecosystem is to start introducing such systems. Then we move even further into the AI run world, right? Not the world of Skynet, not the world of a machine god, but the world of these many strange, like, you know, many strange algorithms behaving in ways that humans can't quite predict. In a way, perhaps the future is this kind of transhuman ecosystem of uh, information processes. And then the big question is, well, can humans thrive in such an ecosystem? And can it be made to uh, match the material constraints of our world? Those, I think, are open questions. But ultimately, I feel that I'm optimistic. The reason why I'm optimistic is satellites can measure quite well how much of the Earth's land area is covered by forests. Satellites can monitor the garbage patch in the middle of the Pacific. We can, in fact, measure how much CO2 there is in the atmosphere. These are simple physical properties. In a very real sense, the Earth is not trying to hide from us. The Earth is just there waiting to be studied. It is an extremely complex system. And as all complex systems, it in principle will be difficult to predict, but we can take samples. We can understand the current state. If you try to understand the current state of society, always, of course, there are parts of society that will try to present a different picture. In other words, they'll have an anti-inductive property. Every sort of insight that you might believe you have about the economy, you always have to ask yourself, well, has the market already priced this in? So when you try to make these predictions about what will occur, well, perhaps the market will move differently because the market already knew these things. So in a very real way, the more things you figure out, the more complicated our social reality can become now, be it either in markets or in politics. Yeah. I see this phrase coming up in a lot of places. The only way out is through. Yes. Uh, which is what you've, uh, you've just explained. No going back. You just have to find a way to make it work. Yeah, I, th I think we very much have to. A lot of my research focuses on civilizational cycles. And I note that, you know, in the last 10,000 years of human history, if we limit ourselves just to Eurasia, where our records are the best, there are 12 recorded dark ages for different societies where they've either technologically regressed or where their population has dropped notably. Uh, we should be quite worried about that because, you know, if our own civilization fails, the next time around, there won't be any easily accessible coal deposits or iron deposits yeah. for the next civilization to bootstrap yeah. to uh, the space age. So if you could, uh, you know, take one or two or a few lessons that we can learn from these, you know, these, uh, these dark ages or these civilizations that went dark to prevent us from doing so, that would be new to, to people listening. What, what might those be? I think one of them is that the societies, when they are failing don't always understand that they're failing. Roman poets from the fourth century occasionally comment on the roads being bad, uh, but all of their, all of their uh, work seems to be singing about how Rome is like on the cusp of reversing these temporary setbacks all the way until, you know, the state dissolves quite catastrophically from a political perspective. Uh, societies will not always have an accurate understanding of where they are in a cycle. Uh, winning is always a better story than losing. And whether it be, you know, the press releases of a company or the official statements of a president or the proclamations of a pope, things are always going to improve, right? So that's, that's the first lesson. In a failing society, uh, truth and the story of how we're doing might be quite disconnected. Uh, the second lesson is it's important to note when we start cannibalizing institutions. So, when in order to feed your soldiers, you have to requisition things from farmers, 
or when in order to fund expeditions, you have to go into debt, or when basically you have to uh, use old buildings as building material for new buildings. So you can't actually, it's not economic to quarry marble. It's more economic to take the marble from abandoned buildings to build your new building. Uh, these are clear signs uh, that something's not going right. So, you know, perhaps a little bit critically here, I could say, isn't it interesting that one of the best ways to have made money in the last 30 or 40 years has been to liquidate old companies? I think that that would be an interesting case where, well, maybe it's creative destruction or maybe it's a, a self-consuming process because there are not that many good businesses around. So the best way to make money is to like, you know, take an existing economic process and disrupt it. And when we use disruption in Silicon Valley, the implicit the implicit frame is that we're using technology to replace social technology. So that's good. But if you're not innovating in any way and you're just, you know, just dissolving an old structure, are you actually doing anything good? Right? You can have uh you can have uh, destruction of wealth that occurs when you break apart a company, when you break apart working teams and so on. So I would say that when societies examine themselves honestly, the possibility of them slipping into this kind of sleep, into this kind of dream state on a slow, uh, on a slow declining trajectory, the odds of that are much lower. So I think insofar as possible, we have to create an environment where it is possible for people to speak critically of our institutions without being automatically excluded from our institutions. And, you know, liberalism in the 18th century, if I mean the big political philosophy rather than what the term has today, used to have a, a space for this, right? Even 20 years ago, people might have considered a whistleblower uh, more a patriot than a national security threat. Right. Uh, now we've moved more towards the direction of considering whistleblowers national security threats. I think that's as I think that says negative things about our prospects, even if perhaps tactically it's the right thing to do in a competitive environment. I further think that having heterodoxy, so, you know, there's a problem with heresy. The problem with heresy is always that uh, it is all, it is very antisocial people. So people who in fact have issues, who in fact don't have good intent, will be the ones likeliest to be heretics. But heterodoxy is quite different. It means people who are well-versed in understanding how society functions, how it works, what the positive case is for the current societal setup, those are actually the best drivers of reform. One way to think about this is, you know, Gorbachev within the Soviet Union, he wasn't a cynic. He was a, you know, firmly believing Marxist, but he believed the Soviet Union should work differently. Now, of course, today we all, we probably consider the end of the Soviet Union to be a great advance for human liberty and so on. But I think only a Marxist could have done that. Right. And then in China, it was Deng's reforms. Again, Deng was, you know, very much a, a, a believing socialist who proposed, well, does it matter whether the cat is uh, black or white? The important thing is the cat catches mice when talking about the economy. So he was saying, let's not worry about whether this is uh, more compatible with capitalist theory or socialist theory. Let's observe what works, because in order for socialism to eventually emerge in China, China has to be wealthy. So that's why the other saying uh, Deng had was to be rich is glorious, yeah. right? On Marx for a second, a hundred years from now, do you think the Marx legacy will be any different than it is right now? Like, do you think he really predicted something that will unfold in the next hundred years? <laughs> I think Marx is, he's sort of damned by his fans, unfortunately. I think he's worth reading. I think he's wrong on many things. But if you try to produce a large synthetic model of society, you will be wrong on many things. It's still worth the attempt. What does he write about? I think his cultural observations, which, you know, Marxists might say that that's not the point, but I feel that if you read his cultural observations on what life is like in 19th century industrial London, yeah. he captures the reality of actually existing class oppression quite well. Right. I think there are, in fact, things that are just not sustainable social relationships that he observed. Yeah. He made then a prediction of how this will, you know, transform over time. And at least in Europe, the answer was something like this kind of social democratic system. And in the United States, it was more this kind of um, strong prosperity focus that lifted almost everyone up into the middle class. So instead of having an ever-growing lower class that's yeah. working in a highly regulated factory environment, you had a much larger uh, middle class and, you know, the lower class almost vanished, at least from, from popular perception. So Marx, a hundred years from now, well, I think he will be 
regarded much higher than he is right now. And let me make a case for that. I think the Chinese Communist Party is here to stay, at least for a few more decades. Whether they like it or not, their intellectual legitimacy rests on Marx and Mao. So this means that insofar the world becomes more Chinese, it is also a world where studying Marx and citing Marx is more prestigious than it has been. And China, unlike the Soviet Union, will in fact shape large chunks of the world. Now, of course, even the Soviet Union is underestimated. Uh, you know, in the 1970s, you know, you had countries such as Cuba on the other side of the planet, siding with the Soviet uh, worldview, siding with the Soviet economic system. China's borders with the West will never be uh, severed by a Berlin Wall. It's going to be much more of this long-term engagement. Uh, so I believe that all things coming to pass... The perspective will be that, you know, uh, some Chinese thinker has produced massive corrections to Marx, and we might even see the return of Marx into economics, though perhaps he's going to be um, uh, reinterpreted. Yeah. <laughs> reinterpreted in light of a new data. That's how it will be phrased. Wouldn't be the first. Let's talk about a world in which, let's say in the next decade, next two decades, China becomes, surpasses the United States, you know, economically and basically becomes the global superpower. How else does the, does the world or the global order start change. to change? I was born in a country that no longer exists. In 1988, born in Slovenia, which was part of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia broke up through the 1990s. And one of the interesting things about this breakup was that it happened in a position where the geopolitics that enabled Yugoslavia to persist went away. Yugoslavia was a socialist country. But it was a neutral country. So it was trying to play off the Soviet Union, which who they had split away from in the 1950s, and the West, trying to extract maximal economic benefits from both, and knowing that neither side would tolerate a breakup of Yugoslavia because it was a necessary buffer state. The West would fear that communist hardliners that are actually taking directions from Moscow might take root. The Soviet Union would fear that NATO bases might occur, might be set up in former Yugoslav countries. So as long as the Cold War existed, Yugoslavia existed as well, this sort of frozen border area between the two. I think Europe, in many ways, is a frozen border area. A lot of the stability we attribute to institutions like the European Union are the result of there being no large contestations in Europe by superpowers. When we do see contestation, such as in Ukraine, we see some much more familiar patterns. We, th we see things like the annexation of Crimea, we see civil wars, and so on. So as China reaches into Europe, it's not that China will be malevolent in its influence at all. But when we hear news such as Italy signing up for the you know, road and belt initiative, that should tell us the world is changing. This means that there will be a game of influence played by at least the United States and China and possibly other powers in Europe, which means that countries, countries that are neighbors, that have conflicts, instead of existing in the orbit of a single international order, will be able to switch between one and the other. And the history of the Cold War teaches us that sometimes proxy conflicts might arise. So an unfortunate prediction for Europe is I expect less political stability for Europe. I expect it's going to be economically and technologically less central because despite the efforts of the European Union, they have failed to replicate Silicon Valley in Europe. They have failed to, um, you know, create new global markets for new products. They've mostly just defended uh, their market share for some old products. Uh, they will need Chinese money, just as they once needed access to the U.S. market. They will now need Chinese investment, Chinese money, and access to the Chinese market, which means the consensus around human rights is going to start fracturing quite badly. It is not hard to imagine Viktor Orban of Hungary uh, making a very favorable trade deal with China, perhaps one day exiting NATO, perhaps even inviting the Chinese to set up a military base or two. The geopolitics of military bases is not often discussed. One of the most important services the United States provides countries like, say, Estonia or uh, the other Baltic republics or Poland is that there are U.S. troops there. Yeah. Were the Russians to invade, U.S. troops would be killed. And it would be politically very difficult for the U.S. to not respond. So even if the U.S. doesn't care about Poland or care about Estonia, politically, internal politics force a response. So when I propose something like uh, a European country leaving NATO and joining some sort of military arrangement with China, 
That means the Chinese have their tripwire. That means that country is relying on China rather than the U.S. for its security. One might then ask, well, but what possible geopolitical reason might China have for this? And I answer that the Mediterranean is an area of vital interest. That's why Italy's uh, inclusion into this new alternative economic order is such an important fact. So much of European trade goes through the Mediterranean, through the Suez Canal, through the Indian Ocean. If you look at any map of global trade, this is the lifeline of Eurasia. You don't ship goods from China to France via railroad, and you don't ship them through the... Uh, Arctic Ocean, though that might that might still happen uh, if global warming continues. You ship them through the Indian Ocean, and you ship them through Suez, and you ship them through the Mediterranean. So I think that eventually uh, the Middle East will also change, and there might see more integration between the Middle East and Europe. I think we will see some economic development in countries such as Turkey, countries such as Algeria, and I think we're going to see some European countries and some fragmentation in Europe. And it's going to take a lot of psychological adjusting. The idea of a Western country being relatively poor compared to an Asian country and perhaps being the playground of foreign powers, that just, it, it just doesn't match our intuitions, yeah. right? You know, it's interesting. Um, there was this tweet somewhere we were talking about where M&A for countries is back because you were talking, you're hearing about USA and Green Greenland. And then also, of course, what's happening in, in East Africa. Why don't you talk a little bit more about what that could look like? I think that the Indian Ocean might become the real hub of the world economy. I think trade between China and the United States is almost at its peak. I think there won't be more trade between the two powers in the future. And the U.S. economy is certainly not going to grow massively in the near future either. What are how are fast-growing economies? Well, there are fast-growing economies in East Africa, such as Ethiopia. And these are countries with hundreds of millions of people. Ethiopia is currently projected to hit 200 million people. So imagine 200 million Ethiopians living at a level of prosperity comparable to, say, modern-day Turkey or modern-day Mexico, maybe one day even Italy. Those are massive markets. So where will that trade go? It's not going to go through the Pacific Ocean. It's not going to be between, say, uh, China and Australia and Chile and the U.S. It's going to be between China, Europe, East Africa, and India. And yes, also the Middle East. So the big missing story of the 21st century is the importance of the Indian Ocean. Everyone talks about the Pacific, but I would argue the Pacific was far more vital in the 20th century than it, was in the, than it will be in the 21st century. In the Pacific, everyone has already played their cards. The U.S. has allies where it has allies. China has allies where it has allies. A few of them will flip back and forth. A few of them, like Indonesia, will even be large markets that will grow. But for the most part, globalization has already played out its story there. The next wave of globalization will be the Indian Ocean. And this is why China has positioned itself so strongly, including developing a larger and larger navy. It has been a fact of globalization that the ability to use military interventions to protect your investments is a fact of life. The original setup of, uh, you know, the age of discovery was that Portuguese ships sail into India. They buy some spices. They sail back. Eventually, they decide that, you know, we should have a warehouse and buy when the spices are cheapest. So they have a warehouse and they, of course, have to have soldiers to protect the warehouse and then when there is a civil war in the country where you're running your massive business, can you afford to stand by the sidelines? Especially if one side in the civil war is asking you to, you know, lend your three or four hundred musket men, and you know your three or four hundred musket men guarding your facilities can turn the tide of the war. Well, at that point, you're embroiled in lo local politics, and whether you like it or not, you're the kingmaker. I think that we won't see an outright return to something like colonialism, but I do think free trade areas and economic areas that are regional rather than global will make a comeback. So China will be the kingmaker in a lot of East Africa, will never annex the countries, nothing like that, but might include them in their equivalent of NATO or their equivalent of the European Union. And you might have uh, people visiting from East Africa going to uh, Chinese universities rather than American universities to learn about how to run companies or how to run political systems. It is interesting. You know, Peter Thiel had this line that uh, sort of AI 
and crypto are sort of like communism versus cap, like centralization world versus decentralized world. And in one, I do you agree with that analogy or, or metaphor? And to, in a, in a world where China wins or is the power, does that mean that it's a much more centralized world and that sort of ethos pervades? I want to caution the idea that blockchain will decentralize society. I, I think that what we have to face is the reality that while a particular transaction might be anonymizable, and let me note, by default, no transactions on, say, Bitcoin are anonymous. They're actually all stored yeah. in a perfectly public ledger. Talk about a, a, a dream. Uh, the IRS's dream is that everything goes through Bitcoin and nothing is anonymized. I think that in that case, you, you can't really avoid taxation. You can, in fact, tax extremely effectively. Our phones, when they're running these anonymized transactions, are not themselves anonymized. So unless we have a radical transformation of consumer information, the consumer information ecosystem, physical identity will always be tied to your digital identity. It'll be trivial to tie the two. And if it's trivial to tie the two, you might have improvements in financial systems. You might have fewer intermediaries. You might have fewer unusual financial situations. Uh, you might have something like sound money, perhaps, if the sort of Austrian-inspired economic theories are right. Uh, but state power will remain. Yeah. Taxation will remain, yeah. right? And taxation is the heart of it, right? If you look at the big trend, what distinguishes a state in 2000, you know, in 2019 from a state in 1819 or 1619 is how centralized the taxation system can be because that limits the resources of the state and these resources of the state can then be deployed for these massive, massive infrastructure investments that, uh, you know, unify parts of the world or these massive militaries. Right. But if Zcash really works or these other privacy based currencies, not, not Bitcoin, do you think that governments, do you think that money and state will be separated? Do you think governments will have a hard time? I think they will have a harder time manipulating currencies directly, but currencies are just one of the tools of government. Note that the income tax was in some ways as important for the increase of the power of the state as, uh, you know, the central banks have been. Central banks are a lever to alter the economy. But something like the income tax that has massively increased state power does not depend on it. You could have something like Zcash succeed, but because digital identity will still be tied to physical identity, income tax will remain unaltered. Perhaps this will mean that the Fed loses power, but states will find other ways to exercise power, innovative ways. After all, imagine a world where there is no Fed, but there is mass surveillance. Has the power of the state increased or decreased? I would argue increased. So on net, the move is still centralizing. Do you disagree with the sovereign individual thesis anywhere? That but, uh, I guess and it would posit that people can move and you know, start their own countries or join other country, countries that people other people have started that have more favorable you know, views. I guess, where do you uh, disagree with the thesis of sovereign individual, if at all? I sort of feel that the sovereign individual thesis is too individualistic. That's an easy shot to take at it. It does have a kernel of truth to it. I think the world might become more similar to the medieval world than people might want to think about. Uh, in, say, medieval Europe or, you know, 14th century China, actually, no, in 14th century India, not China, you would carry your law with you. So if you were an Irishman traveling into what is today France, you would likely be tried according to Irish laws. That's remarkable. Today, we're so used to this notion that, you know, territories define law rather than individuals. But note, you traveled from Ireland to France, you were assumed to be under the jurisdiction of an existing system of law, you didn't create a system of law de novo. So what I think might happen is there will be much more institutional flexibility. And there might be some optionality for you to switch between different systems of law. But let's, for example, consider the protectionist incentives of existing jurisdictions. For example, if today you wanted to renounce U.S. citizenship and, say, take up, I don't know, Chinese citizenship, uh, the U.S. government reserves the right to continue taxing your income for 10 years. <laughs> That's quite punitive. Of course, the new country is not absolving you from your income tax there, so your tax situation becomes notably worse. And the U.S. is one of the most friendly countries with regard to, uh, you know, allowing people to leave or enter and so on. So if that's the situation there, I think protectionist measures will be undertaken by these collaborative uh, ecosystems, these legal jurisdictions. Some jurisdictions might eventually be uh, implemented on the blockchain, right. and those might be less protectionist, so they might have uh, fewer barriers to you exiting. But then you have to ask yourself, if there is a network effect – 
and the network is not difficult to leave, at one point, they just might fall away and be abandoned quickly. And the landscape will come to be dominated by blockchain implementations that make you commit to a particular jurisdiction. Hopping between legal jurisdictions is so open to abuse that it's just going to have to be stabilized somehow. Yeah. Now, again, perhaps the legal system will be divorced from individual states. People, again, don't really consider that things like common law or like medieval Irish law were not run or implemented by states. Uh, Icelandic law and modern Somali law might be additional examples of these community-driven legal approaches. So the empowerment of the individual, perhaps, I feel when you look at these societies, it's not really the individuals that are empowered. It's the communities, yeah. right? It's your, it's your village near Mogadishu, or it's your little clan on the shores of icy Iceland, right? Or it's your tribe in, you know, the hills of Scotland. Yeah. So I think we will see more the empowerment of these sort of community groups that can organize through technologically mediated tools such as the blockchain and less individuals being to radically self-determine. Yeah. Decision fatigue ultimately plays a role. I can decide and customize many parts of my life, but it's not tenable for me to do that for all parts of my life. Right. Let's talk about immigration for a second. What do you, th you know, because there's also, we're talking pushback for free trade. There's also pushback for Im immigration uh, on that, on sort of the Peter Thiel side. But then there's also the sort of, you know, Tyler Cowen, Brian Kaplan, sort of open borders, it's sort of the free lunch. H how do you think about what's the ideal Im immigration policy a country should think about? And what are the trade-offs as it relates to basic income or, you know, welfare in general, if you're letting anyone in? I think that the social system of the country matters immensely, where it be, has become very clear that uh, different Western countries have had different experiences with the question of, of immigration. And the question is only going to become more important, because ultimately, it's not the world's poor that are moving. It's the world's middle class. You have to be able to afford travel in order to migrate to a, you know, a developed country. Canada has done an extremely good job uh, and has thrived, honestly, from very selective immigration where they have a points-based system. Uh, arguably, that has served them very well. And then arguably, countries such as France have had a less positive experience, even though they were quite restrictionist. They faced a lot of difficulty integrating communities uh, because it eventually did occur that there were entire communities of people. The social problems there are not really addressed um, the economic problems are not really addressed. It's not, again, it doesn't help uh, maintain their welfare states as such. The U.S. is a mix of the two. I think the U.S. has had some real cultural frictions over immigration, but honestly, it feels much more an internal fight over immigration than actual social stress caused by immigration. So were the U.S. to have a functional political culture, a functional, well, culture, right? A, a, a environment where there is no culture war being waged. It could absorb far more immigrants without any, any sort of risk to the political system. However, I think this is not the current U.S. So there's a pragmatic case to be made for limitations to immigration, not because of economic concerns, but because of the concerns of how it might exacerbate internal divisions in the country, yeah. right? So there are also, you know, obviously countries such as uh, Japan that I think are paying a pretty stiff price for not uh, not adopting some system of immigration to alleviate their demographic problems. Um, now, you know, Japan has a very old population. The population is shrinking. The dependency ratio, that's the ratio between the people who are, you know, actively engaged in the economy and the people who are supported by the people actively engaged in the economy. The dependency ratio is uh, skyrocketing as you have the problem of, you know, one adult working person supporting two or three grandparents, yep. either directly their own grandparents or through taxation. Arguably, the Japanese economy is doing quite well because even though its working age population has shrunk, on paper, it's remained about the same size. That actually says your productivity is going up. It's just the number of people is going down. I think were Japan to be capable of adopting a system more similar to Canada's system, it could have remained a globally relevant power for the foreseeable future. Now, the problem here is the social technology required to function well in Japanese society is quite demanding. Canada is a more user-friendly environment than Japan. Japan requires almost a lifetime of learning to master the intricacies of social life. I think we actually have differences between cultures in terms of how easy is it to become 
Japanese yeah. or to become Canadian or to become American or to become French and so on. Part of the problem of European countries is that European countries have cultures that are more difficult to master for the newcomer than, say, the cultures of North America. So it's a lot of it comes down less to these economic decisions and more to the intangibles of daily life or, say, work life and so on. Let's go deeper into integration. You know, there's this view of uh, history, you know, promoted by the book Non-Zero, which basically uh, says that we either need to uh, globalize peacefully and, and come together, or it's we you know it's just we end in chaos. And I wonder why it couldn't be actually we now localize and there's you know if the Charter City move, movement takes off, there's sort of a, a thousands of Israels or thousands of Norways or thousands you know like like groups just coming together you know independently. Uh, and sort of less globalization and, and it happening peacefully. Do you see a world in which that happens or how do you view that phenomenon? Well, I said that I expect regional blocks to become more important. So in a way, regional blocks are globalizing in another way they aren't. I think that if through peaceful means of a global union or through the military means of a global empire or some fusion of the two, which is always likeliest, uh, some form of globalization will win. But the question then is, is this a global nation state or is this a global, you know, federated system? And I think the answer is clearly yes, it's going to be a federated system. There's in fact no contradiction between having um, hundreds of Norways all over the world because, you know, Norway might be a member of NATO. This doesn't really detract from its Norwayness, but it certainly means that uh, it is not, it's not, it cannot become an empire in its own right. It can't become what is termed a superpower. So, this is very interesting. The cosmopolitan nature of empire is often underestimated. If you can create these large blocks that are self-sufficient, then you have a world that's fragmented with societies that are sort of these divided war camps. If there's perhaps just one war camp, eventually, the local regions can argue for administrative privileges of a certain kind. You might have a world where the country is notably self-managed, but their capacity to project power is very limited by the center. Uh, some of this stuff is things that I think can be analyzed productively through, through empire theory, where the ideal global equilibrium after globalization has run its course is a sort of high mid alliance, where the prosperity of individual countries adds to the strength and viability of whatever global central authority emerges. In that world, that's a world of um, a lot of local variation, a lot of local autonomy, a lot of local variation, where many different social systems can be tried, but the overall security architecture isn't really uh, impacted negatively. Unfortunately, though, I think that a likelier outcome might be a world where high is in conflict with the middle powers, right? The sort of situation where whatever central authority emerges has such a strong need in order to secure itself, to undermine regional authorities, that in fact there'll be little variation in governance. I applaud all efforts to help middle-sized everything from uh, the kind of communities I described to city-states to nations develop actually different social technologies and actually different systems of governance. Yeah. That is the dimension where if they have such an overabundance of positive options to build themselves up, these country-sized, city-sized, community-sized groups, then central authority will simply be unable to eliminate them, even if they are political rivals. I think a lot of people desire a weakening of global institutions and believe this will lead to local re resurgence. I think that's impossible. I think the direction of history does point towards a strengthening of the center, but there's no reason there couldn't be uh, a strengthening of the, reg of the regional, perhaps even a strengthening of the regional that uh, allows for more variety than what we see right now. Right. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I'm curious how we solve some of our global, you know, climate change, AI, nuclear proliferation, some of these global coordination problems that in some sense are a bit abstract, right? Like at least in the climate change or AI, like do we need to sort of invent some sort of uh, common enemy or, you know, anthropomorphize climate change or something? Like how do we, how do we coordinate globally or do we actually have some sort of global governance? <laughs> I mean, I, I think this is going to be an interesting test of both human psychology and of uh, how well our aggregate systems work. I think that if we have to adopt some sort of fictionalized enemy outside of mankind for our coordination, that's going to be quite fragile. We're going to have to find something that's relatively non-adversarial. I think certain things can be found 
I think that there is hope for us to manage the global commons well, because on a much smaller scale, communities of people have managed to uh, have managed to manage commons in the past. Things like pastures, fishing rights, and so on. There had always been these local solutions that were found that even in conflicts weren't really overturned or violated. So if we can find a situation where we understand and agree the global climate needs management, but it is also understood to be something of a war crime to try to uh, aggressively alter the world's climate to favor your country, but not other countries, that can be a stable equilibria that doesn't require the sort of like a utopia where everyone's holding hands, but is a livable, is a livable system. So what you've said is underrated, I think, in his understanding of politics and stability is Henry Kissinger. And I'm curious what he might say if he was listening to this conversation, you know, thinking about the future, uh, where, where he might agree, disagree, why you think he's underrated, what do you, what do you think is underappreciated about what he really understood about, you know, global stability? I think that for Henry Kissinger, the key thing people misunderstand is they perceive him to be an enforcer of an existing world order, but he always saw himself as someone who is trying to build a semblance of world order. He has like this stringent scholarly definition of what state what sort of state must exist between global elites for it to be considered a real system. And he understood that we are emerging from something like a period of anarchy. Nominally, the United Nations exists, but obviously in the time of his career and today, we could not really rely on that institution to coordinate us effectively, nor does it seem to be on the road to being upgraded to that or re-evolving into that or being reinvented we were going to have to find other methods. And these other methods were the transformation of what was a zero-sum game between the Soviet Union and the United States of two players, where one side's victory is another side's loss, into a three-player system, where any two sides might find favorable arrangements that benefit both. That transition from a world of the Soviet Union and the U.S. to a world of the U.S., China, and the Soviet Union, and how much this contributed to alleviating the sort of dynamics that might have led to mankind's destruction, greatly underestimated. I think easily the opening up of China at the time was the correct move. It was the correct move to like separate it from the Soviet Union. It's a different question whether our policy on China should have changed come 1991, but that's after Kissinger's era of greatest influence. That makes it a single-handed contribution, I think, to world stability and peace that shouldn't be underestimated. So he had an understanding of what affects the international order, and he tried to build an international order where win-win situations could be constructed. Yeah. What sort of takes the place of religion in the future or what, what rises up and I know you've studied sort of the rise of religion in the, in the bronze age or, you know, religion and state in particular, what fills the role that religion used to fill in sort of a world where, you know, we have different realities, different versions of truth, you know, you know, markets uh, sort of road communities in some senses. How do you see that playing out? I think the, the very simple answer is new religions. I think the religions arose in a context where something very similar was happening. Uh, people would encounter tribes that believed in radically different gods. And then you could decide, well, these are all secretly the same gods. And, we, you know, Athena and Osiris and all of these, these are just different names for the same forces. That was one response. And a different response was, well, we're going to construct our own reality, even if others disagree, and we're going to try to persuade others to join that reality. We tend to think of the world as a world with settled religions, where there are regions of the world that are Christian or regions of the world that are Buddhist or regions of the world that are Muslim. But that was the outcome of this process. That wasn't the reality before this process began when religions were first arising. In a very interesting way, maybe my prediction is in the next 200 years, if current trends were to persist, because of the highly mediated environment, because of the environment where um, social media algorithms affect the viability of memes as much as their appeal to individuals, a world where you actually have different competing authorities that you might trust or might not trust, that's a fertile ground for the creation of new religions. Now, some of them might call themselves old religions, or at least cloak themselves in the bodies of old religions, and others might not even call themselves religions at all. They might call themselves ideologies. But new ones will arise, and I think eventually a few of them will be the winners. Yeah. I've, always, I've been surprised at how, you know, we have new social media platforms or new, new sort of big tech companies every 30 years, but religion, there hasn't been that much innovation, and maybe the ground wasn't fertile, or maybe the innovation is, 
is that, you know, new clothes on an old thing or how would you respond to that? Well, I would say that I think anyone that's experienced uh, the social media environment on Twitter and Facebook realizes that we need new moralistic norms for how to behave. Our old norms don't really work super well. You know, a world where for a minor misstep, you might get tens of thousands of people sending you angry messages. We're going to have to find better means of a... And and not just how to behave, even the mythology of how to make sense of what's happening. Like, what is AI? You know, what is virtual reality like what is what is truth what is reality yeah people are experiencing alienation because no one has yet told them how to find the meaning in the phenomena that they're finding and part of the role of religion is to connect meaning to your environment right and uh i think that will happen i think people will ascribe uh religious meaning to artificial intelligence and also ascribe religious meaning to uh, their social media experience and what do you think the new atheist is sam harris richard dawkins uh you know chris richens the late chris richens what did they not understand about or fully appreciate about the role of religion here? Like why, why couldn't, why wouldn't atheism be the new religion? I guess. I think, I think their view here is, well, I'm going to point out, you know, Sam Harris, you know, he, he, he's famous for being a new atheist, but he's also famous for getting millions of people to start meditating. So, you know, I have to question his atheism a little bit where it's like, yes, I'm sure you don't believe in a God classically conceived, but I'm wondering what are your actual metaphysics when you are clearing your mind and performing meditation? Well, maybe when you talk about meditation, you talk about the rational scientific worldview, but when you're meditating, is that really what's happening on the inside? Or are you perhaps as a tool to alter your mind adopting different metaphysics and then you have to also ask you know well richard dawkins has described himself uh, himself as a you know cultural christian so i think maybe the best way to understand the new atheists is they believed that old religions had severe problems and they generalized well we are going to go into a society with no religion because this is the way to address these problems be they terrorism or like lack of scientific progress or uh, people being exploited by buying into like false belief systems. We're going to have something like public discourse, and we're going to have a culture where everyone can critique each other. So several fundamentals here. One of them is they didn't think about how adaptive new and different religions might be. That would be my first one. My second one would be they overestimated how livable a cultural critique, uh, an environment of cultural critique is. They thought that, you know, in lively debate between religion and science, which I feel is like a little bit of a straw man, but still they thought that science would win and truth would win. But, you know, we see right now that in a very harsh culture of criticism right now, truth doesn't always win. Facts don't always win. If you're an early stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you. Please hit us up at villageglobal.vc slash network catalyst. 